This is a 10 minute short talk about what one should know about SPAR ML Live. So I want to make sure everybody in the same, the right sessions. Yeah? All right, so that's 10 minutes. I have never done a 10 minute talk before. So this is my first time doing this. I've given you talks many times before, but never in 10 minutes. And let's see how this goes. And I also need to leave immediately after this to catch BART to go back to San Jose. So I, I have to finish this by 10 minutes. <laughs> Just curious, how many of you are familiar with Spark? All right, most of you. And I guess most of you have not played with ML, uh, Spark ML lib component. Is that the case? All right. So we're going to learn everything that is about ML lib in 10 minutes. No, just kidding. <laughs> but if you have not uh, read this, go ahead and take 30 seconds to read it. I think it's pretty applicable to do machine learning. Uh, part of it's true, part of it is kind of funny. So just start up the pile until you start look until the data looks right. So anyhow, so very quickly at a high level, Spark uh, is a unified data processing engine. It's very, very popular, being adopted by many, many companies, as we know. Um, the new, not so new anymore, the data abstraction is by, based on the data frame APIs, right? It sits on a very strong distributed core, Spark core level there. And uh, just like other components, all the com components on top of data frames, uh, on top of that, it sits on data frame API, which is very easy, easy to work with. So MLlib is just another component uh, from the perspective of Spark. Okay. And it's the high level goals of this MLlib component is to help make practical machine learning scalable and easy, right? To leverage the the dis distributed nature of uh, Spark to run all these computations in the distributed manner. So you have a large data set, and hundreds of terabytes, and you have thousands of features, you can totally leverage Spark to be able to train your model in that fashion. So it's not only scalable, but also make it easy. That has always been one of the tenets of, uh, from the Spark designers, to make things easy to use. And based on the data frame API, and that's how things uh, are a little bit easier. And uh, also, in terms of the de developing machine learning model aspect that you probably learned from other talks, uh, usually does involve some kind of a workflow that you go through, right? And usually you have to handcraft that, and it's kind of a, in the real world, it's, it's, it's a, a lot of steps you have to go through. And if you have to handcraft that, then it can be a little bit uh, challenging to manage all that. So the MLLib also provides a, a few classes to help managing that uh, so to make it easy. Okay. And to dissect inside what's inside the MLLib component, our library, essentially you can bucket those features into these four buckets. Uh, one of them is algorithms. Obviously, it contains a uh, set of commonly used uh, ML algorithms that we all know of, right? Um, I don't have uh, deep learning on here, but it's, uh, the community is actively working on integrating that into Spark MLlib component as we speak. So that's one part of the MLlib. The other one is the pipeline, which the one that I'm going to focus uh, as uh, the, ne the next couple of slides. So I want to highlight that part of MLlib component. At the bottom, there's a bunch of uh, facility for help with doing feature engineering, uh, for transforming your data and whatnot, and also a bunch of utilities for doing linear algebra and uh, generate statistics and whatnot when you're working with your data. So as we know, doing this is a very simplified model or uh, workflow of doing machine learning, right? Uh, we know that we got to load and clean data, feature extraction and whatnot, and do finally do model training and then evaluations, and then you might have to rinse and repeat, depends on what you're doing. So how does Spark help with this flow? Well, it provides a few abstractions that mirror pretty much each of those steps that I just talked about. So as you can see in this picture, and the previous one is pretty much very, very similar. So if I provide a transformer estimator, so those are terminologies in terms of Spark landscape, but they do 
what, it, what they do is pretty much the task of each of these boxes. Okay, so I'm going to go into each one of these uh, in this slide. So the first one is transformer. Transformer is uh, commonly used for doing the pre-processing step, right, for doing futurization. Uh, oftentimes, you got to convert from your text data into numbers, or um, you got to transform in such a way that that the the input to the algorithm, because at the end of the day, everything has to be numbers. So whatever your data is, you got to transform it. You might have to scale it down, scale it up. So that's what transformers are. So you can do normalize the data, tokenization, and so on. And so it does that. Once you're done with that, so you might have five transformers. You could have 20 transformers in your data, depends on what you're doing and depends on what your data is. Estimator is um, essentially your, learning algorithm, your uh, machine learning algorithm that you want to use. That could be logistic regressions or uh, uh, collaborative filtering and all that stuff. So, and it and it returns a model. With that model, they, we can use that to do prediction effectively. So, examples here we got logistic regression, and then that returns a model. Okay, so we got transformer, estimator. So once you have a model, you can do some predictions. The next step you definitely want to do is to do some kind of evaluation in your model to see how well it does. So Spark MLlib provides a set of evaluators to uh, calculate a common set of metrics, like the ROC, the RMSC, and stuff like that. Um, so it has, like for if you do binary, then you can do binary classification evaluator. Uh, if you want to use cross validator, which is a very, very cool class for helping with uh, tuning with uh, your parameters and whatnot. Each of these concepts is think of it as like an abstraction or, or an interface that has a specific method that, that it uses. In this case, it's the fit method. Let me go back. Estimator is the fit, and then transformer is a transform. Okay. So with, with transformer, estimator, evaluator, now we can build a pipeline. Right? So pipeline is consisting of a bunch of these. In this one, it just does two transformer, but like I said, in your case, it could be many, many more transformer, and they can change in certain order that you want. Obviously, these things have to run in certain specific order, right? So the way you wire it up is in that specific order. Here's just an example of a little bit of a messy pipeline where you, there are many transformers going on here, and they chain together, and they, it's like a workflow. They, you know, two of them have to be complete, completed before you go to the next one, and so on. So how does it look in code? The code looks something like this. The first one is the tokenizer, that's the transformer. And the second one is the hashing function, that's, uh, that's a transformer. And then the logistic regression is your estimator, that's your algorithm. So the way you wire it up is basically create a pipeline and set the stages and give it an array of steps that you want it to execute in that order. Right? And then finally, at the bottom, we have this pipeline and we call fit on it and give it the training data that we want to train the algorithm on. And it will automatically execute those stages in the right sequence that we tell it to do. So that's, that's kind of the beauty, beauty behind this little, little um, abstraction to make things easier to manage. Right? Imagine you have 20 of these, then it's reading to the code to, to see exactly what goes to what. It can be challenging. But by having this little pipeline, you can easily identify these. And the last couple of slides I want to talk about is uh, automating model tuning is very tedious work if you have done this before. Uh, there's a concept called cross-validating, validation, uh, using the KFO concept by splitting your data into multiple sets. And uh, you can run that K times. So this is K equal 5. It divides your data set into five sections. Uh, K minus one for training and the, the remaining one for testing. So, Smart uh, MLlib provides this class called cross cross eval cross validator, right? And also the param grid as well. So you can enter all the different uh, configuration of certain parameter that you want to try to uh, train your model on, basically. So in this example, we have two for the 
uh, regularization parameter and two for rank. And our foe is three, so that means that this thing is going to run 12 times, effectively. Um, or more, yeah, 12 times. So you're going to get back, like, it's going to train 12 models. And then it's going to use your evaluator to figure it out, figure, figure it out w which one is the best one, and then give it back to us. Finally, the last slide, I got a signal back there, is the model persistence. Another cool thing. You probably learned from other uh, from talks that data scientists have their own world. They do the modeling, the um, experimenting, whatnot. So how does uh, how does Spark make it easier to hand that model over to data engineer to take to production? And the model for systems is a facility for doing that in Spark. Obviously, I think there's a lot of uh, machine learning library out there. They're trying to work with all those community to come up with a common way of persisting a model. Uh, so that's still work in progress. And um, one minute passed, and thank you. Hopefully that was useful. <laughs>